what we're going to be talking about today. In our scripture today, um, it said, My brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of any kind, consider it nothing but joy. And as Dee said, that's a lot easier said than done, right? But these next weeks, um, we're going to be diving a little bit more into that and how we can um, come to a place where ultimately we can line up and trust that everything is happening uh, for the greater good of ourselves and for everyone. Um, and I'm doing this based on the book, The Book of Joy, uh, with the Dalai Lama and the Archbishop Desmond Tutu, and this was written by Douglas Abrams. When I picked up the book, The Five Invitations, this was sitting right next to it at the library, and I was like, oh, I've gotta have this book. So when, as I've been reading this, three things came to my mind that I think are really needed for this spiritual journey, but also for this journey of really deepening into what this joy is and how to access this deeper joy. Uh, the first one is spiritual practice. We talk about this a lot. But it is so important that we have something that we do on a regular basis. And I want to say, first thing in the morning is very important because this is our opportunity to set our intention for the day, to center ourselves in that place of peace, in that place of remembering and knowing that there is only God and that God is for me, to set our intention for how we want to experience the day. You know, today I'm going to go out and I'm going to be an instrument of peace. Today I'm going to be awake and aware to where maybe I'm off center. Um, um, and I can come back uh, to that place. The second thing is connection. And this is two ways. First of all, the recognition that we are all one, that there is absolutely no separation. And when we can truly walk in that awareness, we connect differently with each other. We connect in a very real and sincere way with each other. And the other aspect, um, of connection is, and guess what? The thought just went out of my head, so we're going to the next one. Trust um, is very, very important. Do I, do I believe that I live in a friendly universe? Do I believe that no one and nothing is against me and that God is for me? Do I trust that there is a bigger picture that I'm just not seeing yet, but that there is a bigger picture and things are gonna work out? So those are the three elements for me that are very important for this journey that we're gonna be on for a few weeks. A couple of scriptures here. Jesus said in John 15, 11, I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be be complete. A second one is like it. Until now you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive and your joy will be complete. In unity we see Jesus as being one of the great metaphysicians. He is an incredible teacher. And his joy was his knowing of his absolute oneness with the God of his understanding. We are not going to try to define God for you. Um, you have to find that uh, that relationship within your own beingness. But he knew his absolute oneness with what he called the Father. Um, so when in this book, what Douglas says is that they were in search of true joy that was not dependent on the fluctuation of circumstances in our lives. How many of us can admit that our joy is kind of, kind of dependent on the fluctuations of circumstances in our lives? Normal in our humanness. But what I want to tell you is we have an opportunity to live differently. And the Dalai Lama and the Archbishop really give us some great ideas on how to get there. So some of the questions that came up is, is it really possible to be joyful even in the face of our daily troubles from frustration with morning traffic? Anybody ever get frustrated with the traffic? It's like a big one I have to work on. I'm always just like, just go the speed limit. Just go the speed limit. I need to work on that. Two, fears of not being able to provide for our families. From anger at those who have wronged us, to grief at the loss of, a, of one that we love, to, from the ravages of illness to the abyss of death. How do we embrace the reality of our lives, deny nothing, but transcend the pain and suffering that is inescapable? And even when our lives are good, how do we live in joy when so many others are suffering 
when, when crushing poverty robs people of their future, when violence and terror fill our streets, and when ecological devastation endangers the very possibility of life on planet. How do we live from this place of joy? How do we live without feeling sometimes a sense of hopelessness, a sense of feeling like we, we feel helpless in, in how we can show up and what we can do? Well, they had over a thousand questions that they received, and it was fascinating that the most question that was asked was not how could we discover our own joy, but it was actually related to this last part, but how could we possibly live with joy in a world filled with so much suffering? And the reality is for us, you guys, we live in Springfield, Missouri, and we don't see a lot of that suffering. You know, we, we, are, we, are, we live our own lives, we go out, and we, you know, sometimes we'll see homeless people on the side of the street, but generally we're not right in there seeing it. We don't feel or experience the suffering, a lot of us, of a lot of our family and friends who are discriminated against. We, um, we don't uh, experience the suffering that is, you know, of kids who don't have enough, don't get to eat breakfast before they go to school, don't have enough food. Um, don't have, uh, you know, what they need is their basic, uh, basic necessities of life, or the suffering of, uh, of people, um, I was going to say on other planets, other countries. <laughs> they seem like other planets because it's so distant from us. But the reality is it's there. And we can't just keep our head buried in the sand about that. We have to recognize, and that's where this oneness comes in, that when I can know that there is suffering of somebody else, what I can do is I can pray for them, and I can pray for what is mine to do and what is mine to be and helping to alleviate that suffering. So the Dalai Lama said that the one question that underlies our existence is what is my purpose? And if you've ever seen pictures of the Dalai Lama or seen him on YouTube or something, this guy is always laughing. He is always smiling. And so he has come to the discernment that really what we seek is we seek happiness, that we seek joy and contentment, and that when we come into the world, um, we really want happiness and we really don't want suffering. How many of us would agree with that? How many of us really want to suffer? <laughs> Come and talk to me if you want to, because we need a talk. <laughs> um, so we really want that contentment and that joy. But what we recognize is those feelings are, are really, they can be fleeting in our lives. Um, and what it comes down to, and we know this, that the source of our happiness is not outside of us. Things outside of us can add to our happiness, can add to our joy, but our true happiness, our true joy is an inside job. So they said that, we must look inside, but sadly, many of the things that undermine our joy and happiness, we create ourselves. Often it comes from the negative tendency of the mind, something for us to look at. Do I tend to go negative? You're going to know by your words when a situation happens. Oh my God, this is the worst thing that can happen. It's never going to work out. Um, or from our inability, or our emotional reactivity, or from our inability to appreciate and utilize the resources that exist within us. The suffering from a natural disaster we cannot control, but the suffering from our daily um, disasters, guess what? We can, and we can, and we can, and I really want us to get that, that we can. We create most of our suffering, so it should be logical that we can also create more joy in our lives. Now, the joy that, I, that they're talking about and that I'm talking about today is the joy in which we can ultimately move with a sense of peace no matter what is happening in our personal lives and in life around us. And I say ultimately because we all have that reptilian brain. It's the fight or flight. And when something happens, we're going to feel the effect of it. And it's okay. I'm always one to say, let yourself feel your humanness. If you need to grieve, grieve. If you need to yell, yell. Don't yell at another person. Just yell. <laughs> um, but ultimately, we want to be able to be awake and aware enough that we catch ourselves and we say, okay, how do I really want to experience this? And then we use the tools that we have to use to get us back to that center place. So the first thing that we're going to look at is what are the obstacles to joy? Well, they name eight of them. Fear, anxiety, and stress. Frustration and anger. Sadness and grief. 
despair, loneliness, envy, suffering and adversity, illness, and the fear of death. We're gonna talk about two of those today, and we're gonna talk about two pillars of joy. And the first one we're gonna talk about is anxiety and stress. And I loved this sentence. Symptoms of chronic stress are feelings of fragmentation and of chasing after time, of not being able to be present. Anybody ever experienced that kind of stress? Just in traffic. Yes. <laughs> Just go the speed limit. No. <laughs> um, the thing is, is that how many of us, our lives are so busy that we do feel fragmented. We feel like we're chasing time and we're not present to what is. And I'm telling you, if we live that way, we're missing so much of what's happening in the present moment. We're missing so many blessings by not being able to be present right here and now. But the question that Douglas asks is, yet we know that in our modern life, stress and anxiety are almost inevitable for us. So how do we make that ride smoother? How do we worry less? How do we breathe and come back to center and, and experience the present moment more? Well, the Dalai Lama tells us that stress and anxiety come, uh, and the frustration of it come from too much expectation and too much ambition. That when we overexert and and then we don't reach our expectations, we don't fill our ambitions, then that's where that frustration comes in. And we're, we're like on the hamster wheel trying to, trying to make it all work, trying to live up to something that probably isn't even ours to live up to. We have so many ideas and so many programs about how, what we should be and how we should be and work hard and do this and do that. We're probably not even clear on what it is that is real for us. And so we're on this hamster wheel of life and it's not even our own life. And that's an interesting thing, isn't it? Um, so, so Douglas says, well, what is too much ambition? Being raised in America, ambition in and of itself seems to be a virtue and could it be that all of this grasping and getting that we want to go to maybe maybe we're missing the mark here maybe you know in a unity we call sin missing the mark maybe that's a sin maybe that's missing the mark that we're so outwardly focused you know we got to go up to unity villages last week for regional conference and dr roger teal was our guest speaker and he just retired from ministry after 43 years and it was interesting because and i've heard this many times before he said you know now is a time in his life that after all of these years of accumulating and grasping and building that now it's the time that he's letting go and he's releasing. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that be great to get that earlier in our lives, that it's not about all the accumulation, it's not about these things that are outside of us. Again, it's not bad to have those things, but when our life becomes this stress mode and frustration and anxiety because of them, then that's not healthy in any way. That's not healthy for us and that's not healthy for the people um, around us. So he said, it's very hard to be joyful with stress and anxiety. We have a continual feeling of feeling overwhelmed and not being able to handle our work commitments, our family commitments, or the digital devices that are constantly reminding us all of the things that we are missing. And juggling things always makes us feel like we're one step behind. And so that's where we go back to our spiritual practice, that it is so important that we are setting that intention for ourselves every morning, that this day I'm gonna be present, this day I'm gonna, I'm gonna walk in peace, this day I'm gonna be awake and aware. And when I find myself in stress and anxiety, and how do you know when you're in stress and anxiety? You feel it. It's your heart. You're stressed, your teeth, you're clenched, you're, you're snapping at people, you're in stress and anxiety. Wake up, wake up, and come back to center. The second obstacle to joy is frustration and anger. The Dalai Lama says where there is fear, there's frustration, and where there's frustration, there's anger. And here's a beautiful question, and I'm gonna tell you, it comes right back to us and it's gonna come back to us over and over again. The question is, what is the hurt that has caused my anger? What is the fear that I have? What is the hurt 
that has caused my anger and what is the fear that I have? And here's what I'm gonna say, and I'm gonna say this very boldly today because I lived with this for a period of time. If you are a person who has outbursts of anger and it is directed towards someone, and you make excuses like this is just who I am, or even if you go and apologize later, there is no excuse for it. There is no excuse for it. It is not okay. Because what's happening is it's actually a very selfish act because you're feeling better because you got it out, but you've got a wounded person left behind here. And you can't make that okay. You can't make that okay. And what I wanna tell you is that it's about a wound in you. It was never about the other person. And so there's a spiritual solution to this. And the spiritual solution is, as is, is Charles Fillmore says, go to God first, go to headquarters first. Go to God, go to the spirit and say, okay, I am willing to be healed. What is it in me that is triggering me that I'm acting out like this? And you know what that spiritual solution may be to seek psychiatric help and to get medication and counseling. That's a spiritual solution, my friends. Don't let anybody tell you it's not. But I wanna be very strong about that because I've seen it all my life and it's not okay. Off my soapbox now on that. Okay, the other thing that Douglas says is that, <clears throat> that certainly anger must have a place and I love this. He said, sometimes it serves a role in protecting us or others from hurt or harm. What I wondered was the role of righteous anger. So the archbishop, during uh, the killings that often marred the peaceful uh, protest against the apartheid, would raise a fist and he would rant. And he would call fire and brimstone down on the evildoers of injustice. And in fact, his, uh, his um, biography is actually called The Rabble Rouser of Peace, which is you know, kind of an oxymoron or a paradox, but it's actually what uh, worked for him. And so here it is, righteous anger is usually not about oneself. It's about those whom one sees being harmed and whom one wants to help. In short, righteous anger is a tool of justice, a scythe of compassion more than a reactive emotion. Although it may have its roots deep in our fight or flight desire to protect those in our family or our group who are being threatened, it is a chosen response and not simply an uncontrollable reaction. And it's not about one's own besieged self-image or one's feelings of separation, but of one's collective of responsibility and one's feeling of deep empowering connection. Can I get an amen on that? Yes, because I'm gonna tell you, it has been righteous indignation that has made most of the changes in our society. And so I wanna to say to you, there is a place for righteous indignation and righteous anger because it moves things to being changed. So yes, I'm so happy. I was so happy to read that. <laughs> okay, now the eight pillars of joy. Perspective, humility, humor, acceptance, forgiveness, gratitude, compassion, and generosity. We're going to talk about the first two. The first one is perspective, and this one is vitally important in really deepening our experience of joy. The first four qualities are qualities of the mind. The second four qualities are qualities of the heart. A healthy perspective is really the foundation for our deep joy because how we view the world, how we view events in our lives determines how we will experience the world and how we will experience events in our lives, yes? Absolutely. Um, or as the Buddha says in the Dhammapada, with our mind, we create our own world. And when we look at one event from a wider perspective, we really do have the opportunity to see things that we wouldn't have otherwise seen, to understand things differently when we're willing to step back and see it from a wider perspective. Um, Edith Eva Erger, eager, I'm sorry, she was the woman I talked about a number of months ago that was in the concentration camps and at 92 wrote about her experience. She shares a story that when she went to um, a military hospital base to see two young men who um, were both quadriplegics and had lost the use 
I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, paraplegics, and lost the use of their legs. And they both had the same um, diagnosis and the same prognosis. And she said the first room that she went into, the man was laying on his bed in a fetal position, and he was just railing against the world. The second man, when she went into his room, he was in his wheelchair. And as he was being wheeled out, he was so grateful for a second chance at life. And they wheeled him out into the garden, and he immediately just said, I am closer to the flowers, and now I can look into my children's eyes. That's perspective. That's the opportunity that we have. And we all have it, you guys. We all have it. We can make excuses why we're not going to see something from a different perspective, but that responsibility lies with you. It lies with you. You cannot put it outside of yourself because it's an inside job. And the moment we put that outside of ourselves, we have disempowered ourselves. Our power comes from knowing that it comes from within. And am I willing to step back and am I willing to see this differently? Now, the um, Dalai Lama... I want to tell you a little bit about the Dalai Lama. He is believed to be the reincarnation of the Dalai Lama before him. Um, and at the age of two, he was swept away from his home uh, in Tibet, and he was taken to this opulent palace. Um, it's a, a thousand-room Potala palace in the ca capital, city of, capital city of Lhasa. And there he was raised in opulent isolation as the future spiritual and political leader. Um, uh, as, and as the godlike like reincarnation of the Bodhisattva of Compassion. Well, after the Chinese in invasion of Tibet in 1950, at the age of 15, all of a sudden the Dalai Lama was the leader of six million people. And he was facing an all-out and desperately um, unequal war. And for nine years, he tried to negotiate with communist China for the welfare of his people. But in 1959, during an uprising, um, it, it, there was a huge risk of a huge massacre. And with a heavy heart, the Dalai Lama decided that he needed to leave his home. And so he um, left at night. He dressed like a, a palace guard. He had to take his glasses off because he's known for his glasses, so he couldn't see well. And he had to you know, go past the, the garrisons of the People's Liberation Army. For three weeks, they traveled by foot through sandstorms and through snowstorms and having to summit 19,000 foot um, snowy, snow peaked um, mountains. And so this was not an easy thing. But he said that one of his practices came from an ancient Indian teacher who taught that when you experience some tragic situation, think about it. If there's no way to overcome the tragedy, then there's no use worrying about it too much. And the archbishop kind of cackled at that because it was like, really? Really? You can just not worry about it? And his teaching actually came from the 8th century Buddhist master, Shantideva, who wrote, if something can be done about the situation, what need is there for dejection? And if nothing can be done about it, what use is there for being dejected? And it's true. And the thing is, you guys, we can practice this. And practice is what gets us to the place where we can, we can meet situations with this consciousness. Where wouldn't it be great if we weren't so stressed and frustrated and, and worried all the time about things? It's a choice. It's a choice within us. But it goes back again to our spiritual practices. And because through our spiritual practices, the more that we connect ourselves, the more centered that we become, the easier it's going to be for us to go, oh, hey, I have a choice here. And I'm going to look at this, I'm going to back up, and I'm going to look at this from a, from a different perspective. The second thing um, is humility. Um, it, well, before we do that, I, I want to share with you that I had a personal experience a while back where someone came into my life, and it was like the Tasmanian devil. And this person just like stirred up all of this stuff. And, and I went down the rabbit hole of judging and blaming and making this person bad and wrong. And you know what? This person was a catalyst for a change that needed to happen. And this change was such a good change. And I was humbled, humbled beyond belief by this experience. 
it took my breath away because it made me realize, oh my gosh, I wasn't trusting. I wasn't, I, I just immediately went down that rabbit hole. Anybody else go down the rabbit hole pretty quickly on things? <laughs> but you know what it's helped me with? It's helped me with everything that's happening in our country and in our world today. And it's not that I'm, I'm gonna stand up for what I think is right and made that really clear. And at the same time, there's a bigger picture here. And we can't see everything that's fallen into place, but I know that God is good. And I know that God works together for the greater good of everything and everyone. So somehow, this is all gonna land in a really good place, it is. And speaking of that being humble, the last thing is humility. And if, if you've ever seen the Dalai Lama, you've ever heard the Dalai Lama, that guy is humble. He believes that nobody is different from anybody else. When people call him a holy man, he laughs. And people think that's funny because he is a holy man and he should be acting like a holy man. And he's always like, I am no different than anybody else. When he goes and he meets with these big leaders, he doesn't think about it because he said nobody is different than anybody else. He shared the story of one time being in a conference with spiritual leaders and this one spiritual leader wanted to be higher than everyone else. So they literally went and they got bricks and they put them under the legs of the chair that this spiritual leader was on and the Dal Dalai Lama said, I have to admit I was sitting there thinking maybe God could get one of those, not God, he wouldn't think of God, Buddha or whatever, could get one of those bricks out from under that chair and make that man fall and then he would be human just like the rest of us. <laughs> um, he's there, none of us are immune to the all, uh, whatever, I love this, this is a, um, a Tibetan thing that whenever I see someone, may I never feel superior from the depth of my heart, may I be able to really appreciate the other person in front of me. Imagine walking with that, that we're one, we're connected. And if somebody is, you know, that is arrogant, I love this. None of us are immune to the all too human traits of pride or ego, but true arrogance really comes from insecurity. Needing to feel that we are bigger than others comes from a nagging fear that we are smaller. And that moves us into compassion because we recognize that what's really going on inside of that person is that they don't, they don't think they're good enough. Doesn't mean we accept the behavior, but okay. Um, and the last thing, uh, oh, and I love this. This was one of my very favorite things uh, that I read. No one is a divine accident. 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 Let's say it together. No one is a divine accident. <laughs> Hallelujah, amen. <laughs> what that means is we all matter and you're perfect just the way you are. And I know we say that on Sunday morning, but we mean that. We mean that, that you came into this world to be the person that you are, to have the experiences that you are because you have gifts to share with the world. You are not a divine accident. I want you to take that in. If there's any idea in your heart and mind at all that you're not enough, you are enough, just as you are right now. You are, you are brilliant, you are magnificent, you are wonderfully made, and you, just as you are with all of your experience, you are needed, you are needed in this world today. And so in closing, I hope that you'll take some of these things today. You know, if something struck you about fear and frustration, stress and anger, but that you'll, that you'll take these things and that you'll step back and you'll let yourself have a wider perspective and that you'll do the work that is yours to do. Because I promise you guys, this life doesn't have to be so hard. It doesn't have to be so heavy. It's not intended to be that. But who's it up to? 